So yeah, anyway, here it is, History Corner this week. I've read, as I mentioned before, I've read a lot of rugby league biographies over the last year or so all of them <laughs> and uh so i, I thought I'd, I'd from time to time give you a bit of an insight into some of these books and give you my review of the books um uh, obviously the the best one of all time is rex moss at the moose that roared uh go back and listen to that uh that segment which is on youtube as well um but yeah an- another one i read was uh ken arthurson it's called Great book. Arco, my game. Great book. The best thing about this book is when it came out. So it came out in 1997 during the Super League War. Yeah. And this guy was just an open wound. Like I am, I'm surprised that he's still alive. The the way he he sounded in that book. As a side note, he was a guest at Origin this week. Well, really? Um, in the in the yeah, box. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which I thought was a lovely touch. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Given the service to the game and, mm, and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Really funny character in the game of rugby league, Ken Arthurson. I remember in Fatty's book, he'd say that every time he'd go in to negotiate with Arco. He he leave there thinking, um, oh, what a great deal I've made. And then when you're driving home, you go, he's got me again. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the book you go to if you want like a, you know, what's and all unbiased account of what happened in the Super League era. It It's incredibly slanted <laughs> in, in one direction, which obviously you can understand that. Um but just as a historical document, it's fascinating. The, the time it came out, the insight it gives into some of the causes of the Super League War, and just the... Uh, he's, he's kind of introspective and, and open to the idea that the, the ARL wasn't perfect, but every step of the way, he kind of obfuscates and, and gives account <laughs> for anything that didn't happen and why it wasn't really his fault. And you remember when we were growing up, the knock on Arthurson was always like, he's the boss of the ARL, but he seems to think that the ARL consists of Manly and no other team. That was a massive knock on him. <laughs> and uh, so he had, there was a lot of resentment about Arco for that. And statements like this do nothing to appease <laughs> any potential detractors. I happened to, this is like page two. So it's <laughs> right out of the gate. This is how he wants to. to frame his narrative i happen to be associated with manly club a place which has been increasingly resented down the seasons by others jealous of manly's front-running efforts in the area of professionalism recruitment and their single-minded search for success manly became very unpopular simply because they made the mistake of trying to be the best (laughs) Uh, and then he goes on I've been accused of being manipulative, of playing favourites, of being a politician wearing a footballer's hat. I stoutly deny the charges, all of them, although perhaps I do have an Achilles heel. I confess freely that I suffer terminally from the condition of deep loyalty to the things I love, such as the club which has been part of my life for most of my life, and to the game of rugby league itself. Later in the book he says, I've never lobbied for anyone that I didn't think was, was worth it. Sure, I lobbied for Bob Fulton to be captain of Australia. Sure, I lobbied for Max Krilich to be captain of Australia. <laughs> but I did it because I genuinely believe they were the best man for the job. How is Max Krilich the best man for the job? <laughs> like he was, 82, wasn't it? He, he was the, the captain of, of the Invincibles. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember him as a player too, too before yeah. our time, but I mean... Yeah. I mean, there was Wally Lewis. There was uh, there was all sorts of players in that era. But yeah, just that's the that's the person Arco was. He just cares too much. <laughs> but also, um, I've I've never been biased, but I've got deep loyalty for Manly. Yeah. It's been part of my life for my, the whole time. Um, the other thing the book does really well is is talk about the era of the 60s and 70s, the, the way the game was run back then, 
We've talked about on the show before those boardroom meetings. <laughs> and uh, Arco's insight into the boardroom meetings are like so good. So he became club sec- manly secretary in 63, I think it was. That long ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, just all right, brief recap of Ken Arthurson's career. So he started playing for Manly as a halfback in the late 40s. Wow. Um, I didn't know he was that old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suffered a, he's late 80s now. He's in his 80s, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he suffered a horrific injury while he was playing in the bush in 53, I think it was. Um, like, legitimately could have died. Had like a knee go into his skull and, you know. Jesus. Um, so that ended his playing career when he was, you know, early, mid-20s. He went on to rise through the ranks of Manly uh, as a coach was first grade coach there from 57 through 61, I believe, and um, had some success, took him to grand finals, uh, then decided he was done with coaching, became a club official, became secretary in 63 or maybe 64, and in 65 became one of the first club secretaries to be full-time paid in that role. I mean, from that time onwards, everyone in the Northern Beaches, the most used word of the year would be Arco. Yeah, yeah. Just the mayor of Manly. Yeah. And his rise to um, power at Manly coincided with a few other then young guys coming through and shaking it up from the, you know... He came in just after the Jersey flag era and came in under the leadership of Bill Buckley, who, who... been around for you know decades so bill buckley was a little younger than those old harold matthews jersey flag era but still of the old school then you had arco come in with bullfrog moore with kevin humphreys uh, it just makes me laugh the dinosaurs were once the uh, i know i know yeah the I'll, layers. <laughs> yeah I'll, re- I'll read you this um it always worried me and still nags at me now that buckley had the wrong perception of me I remember years ago someone telling me, it might have been Ken McCaffrey, of Buckley's opinion of Kevin Humphreys and myself, the, two, the best two young delegates in the game, in the league. But Buckley went on to venture the opinion that Arthurson didn't like him very much. It was only a small thing, but it worried me greatly. Not only did I like Bill Buckley, I really respected him. So, so yeah, just him and, and Bullfrog as these two like young bucks coming through <laughs> and shaking things up. Um, but... <laughs> But those meetings, we've talked about it before, what a like wild, raucous night it would have been. And Arco gets into it here. Geez, it used to get heated down there. And now and then the odd punch would be thrown. <laughs> I was there on the night of the famous blue in which two red-faced officials wrestled through the committee room doors and spilled out into the <laughs> corridor. <laughs> but, but then the, the rugby league trope of all rugby league tropes I learned a lot about rugby league and rugby league men on those long Monday nights at Phillips Street. No matter how fierce the tussle had been during the meeting itself, afterwards a keg would be tapped in the tiny bar in the corner, snacks wheeled in, and peace and mateship in a shared interest would prevail. <laughs> it's just the greatest. You're going to have a keg every Monday. <laughs> he says, The night would end invariably the way it does after a good hard football match. Some yarns and conviviality, an ale or two, and some pleasure in experience shared. I love it because they're all ex-players, so that's the only way <laughs> of getting things done they know. All right, like, you just go hard, like, bash each other for 80 minutes, and then you have a beer afterwards, you know? They bring that spirit to the boardroom. It's the spirit that's the essence of the game and what's held the game back yeah. for 100 years. <laughs> Absolutely. Um and then, of course, like it, it was under Arthurson's leadership that Manly bega- became to be viewed as poachers and buying premierships, the rest of it. Um, you, you know my stance on that. I don't give two hoots about local juniors. No, yeah. Like, did you look in the record books and it says how many local juniors the premiers mm. had? No. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so in the early 70s, they were basically raiding other clubs, South in South in particular. They got Lurch O'Neill, Ray Brannigan, um, Gary Stevens they, they got in. 
the John O'Neill uh, poaching was a massive deal, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, treason, treasonous. yeah, yeah. Um, Sattler's Sattler's biography, which is which is worth a, an episode in itself. Uh, he talks about the sense of betrayal he felt when Lurch told him about it, and so I think Lurch went at the end of seventy one when he told Sattler. Sattler said, "But they're the bastards that broke my jaw." <laughs> All roads in rugby league lead back to Sattler's broken jaw. It's inescapable. Um, but back to Arco and the way he signed players. Just the way he like explained. It's one that you, you've said it. You don't care about local juniors, and and if you are a, a club boss, you should be going after the best players in the game. There's nothing wrong with it. But the way he frames it, I'll, I'll just read this out. Um, so they got Ken Irvine from North in, in the early 70s to come across. And he said, We never brought across players to Manly without them being absolutely convinced that it was what they wanted to do. Irvine, a player of legendary status by that time, was an outstanding example of that. I remember so clearly the conversation I had with him before he joined us. Ken, do you really think you should leave North? I asked him. <laughs> You're a legend there. You're a life member there. You're going to be giving up such a lot. I want you to think long and hard about what you're contemplating. That didn't happen. <laughs> There's no way that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, it's, it's sad to think of Ken Irvine like ending up in a manly jersey after being so iconic with Norths. I agree, but it happens to almost every great player. Exactly. And unlike what happens to most great players, he left a club that did very little the the whole time he was there, ended up winning two premierships at Manly and retiring. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So he got the ending he deserved. Yeah, there it is. Um, I, I, I'd like to see one club play as much as the next bloke, but it's not going to happen... You you slow down a bit. They don't want to pay you the big money. Mm. It happens ninety five percent of yeah. players. Yeah. So so yeah. So Arthurson was genuinely ahead of his time in that regard, and you got to give him some respect for that. He must have been a. Um, I'll give him enormous respect for his contribution to the game. His legendary figure. Um, mm. Just that he must have just been a great salesman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, charismatic guy. So obviously. For a bloke who's been involved in the, the game for so long, the book basically goes from 1948 to 1997 and he's active every step of the way. It's not one of these biographies where you have 300 pa- pages on 10 years of footy in, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. 60s and then, oh, um, and me and my wife Gail live a lovely life on the Gold Coast and, you know, I, st- I still see Sats and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> still see Sats at the Kangaroos reunions. And... But I tell you what, that talking about what sort of um, personality he is, he dominated every year. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like even now, he's still referred to with like this Godfather, mm. Don Corleone style yeah. reverence. Yeah, you'd think uh, Brookie would give him a better stand, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> when your best stand the bike shed, <laughs> it's a bit hard. <laughs> uh, the other interesting thing he touches on is the the Kevin Humphreys scandal in '83. That's got to be a history corner. Yeah, I'm yeah. sending that one into the inbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. We'll work on that. So I won't go into it in too much detail. But it was just I don't know. I found it quite touching the way he spoke about Kevin Humphreys, and obviously Humphreys was his own worst enemy. Um, got himself into a lot of trouble with his gambling. Can relate to that, Kevin. Yeah. Um, you hear a lot of, you know, untoward stories about that era, which, which we won't touch on here. But uh, Darcy Law is back to <laughs> uh, Maybe a, another referee of the time. <laughs> it, it, Hollywood's back to <laughs> <laughs> so, um So, yeah, it was the Humphreys downfall that installed Arthurson into the top job at at the New South Wales Rugby League um, and chairman of the ARL. And you can't deny that he got the job done and was actively trying to push the game forward. Absolutely. Started with Axing Newtown, um, which 
take the emotion out of it, like it, it made economic sense. Should have five more at the same time. Yeah, well, they tried to axe West's um, court action. Like West just dug their heels in. I don't think Newtown were in a financial position to keep the fight going. Well, Singer was running it back then, wasn't he? Mm. So he's a businessman first yeah. and foremost. And then obviously the big one was bringing in the Broncos along with the, the Knights and the Gold Coast in 88. Looking at it, it's a no-brainer now. But at the time, it was considered, what the hell is going on? This is a Sydney game and this is mm. bringing the Brisbane comp down. And, and half of that was coming from the Brisbane rugby yeah, league yeah. Who, who knew that the writing was on the wall if, if the Broncos got in. I think the section of Arco's book which talks about the Broncos era is as compelling as the Super League part. But don't forget the Knights. Yeah. Two cornerstones of the game mm. brought in under his rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in the case of the Knights, like bring back a foundation club. Yeah, but no one thought, everyone thought, you know, it's a rugby league heartland, blah, blah, blah. But no one thought it was going to turn into mm. what it did. Yeah. It's just like, you know, they're triers, you know. Mm. No, no triers back then even. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Henny Penny were there from the beginning. <laughs> they, they believed. All due respect to Henny Penny. <laughs> um, so there were three different uh, bids going for the Brisbane team. There was one um, owned by the guy from Jeans West. There, there was a, <laughs> the Rebel Ticket. <laughs> um, the Sattler's book actually he was he was involved with one of the bids for a while. And, Is the Jeans West boss in the Thoroughbreds? Uh, no, because. The thoroughbreds were the the Paul Porky Morgan camp, who who won out, who won the bid in the end. Um, a good friend of mine went to uni with his daughter. Really, and reckons he's a legend, or was a legend, Wasn't, yeah. was a legend bloke. Really, um, used to enjoy um, large bowl of ice cream nightly. Apparently, um, and I suggest that might might, might have <laughs> contributed to his unfortunate demise. But um, reckon he's, he was the best bloke ever. Yeah, right. And and yeah, so basically, the way Arthurson tells it, it's almost as if Super League was inevitable from the moment the Broncos got in. Uh, I'll, I'll read this quote. In hindsight, one of the worst decisions we ever made at Phillip Street was the one that allowed the Brisbane Broncos into the competition. Right there, in one generous gesture by the league, in the interest of extent, expanding our horizons, was sown the seed of the Super League treachery. And then Arthurson goes on to say that he favoured the Jeans West bid, um, but was eventually sold on the Broncos. We let them in. After a good deal of toing and froing up there and gave them free access, we gave them virtually a licence to print money in that one team, one city setup. They joined and initially did a good job. But almost from the start, they were too self-centred, too greedy. They just didn't give a bugger about anyone else. Everything was so sweet for the Broncos from the moment they stepped into big-time football. They drew huge crowds. Their sponsorship return, returns were spectacular. They were soon making millions. In double-quick time, they became the first club to ever actually make a profit out of rugby league. <laughs> How sad is that? <laughs> we had crowds bursting out of grounds mm. in the 60s in Australia, in, yeah. in Sydney. The first club to ever make a profit. Like it's some sort of unattainable feat. <laughs> it is funny that they're sitting around going, these guys are making money. <laughs> it's nothing, never changed. No, but to be fair, uh, the model of most rugby league clubs up until, it, I don't know when it changed, but they weren't money-making ventures. Anything that, that, they, that came in was redistributed. So if you look at those balance sheets, yeah, the pl- the plus and minus always square up. But let's just look at it. We've got a professional sporting competition with a whole bunch of fans and a whole bunch of merchandise. Clubs full of gambling machines stealing money from the vulnerable, which they get free money from, and they still can't <laughs> turn a profit. Sponsorship. What is going on? Mm. I'll never, I'll never understand no. that. The first club to make a profit. <laughs> yeah. And apparently because of that, they, they were like swanning into Phillips Street, just like, you know, <laughs> like wearing sunglasses, <laughs> and like, you know, splashing cash around. And... Oh, straight away, they were, they were looking for any sort of lariness. Yeah, yeah. And then they, they knew the position they were in 
as, as the first money-making venture in rugby league history. So they were kind of throwing their weight around at board meetings, not taking rules seriously because they knew that there was nothing they could do. Um, you know, they were breaking rules. And Arthurson actually said that at certain points they were considering kicking them out of the competition. <laughs> You imagine it? <laughs> the biggest success story in the history of the game. <laughs> My favourite quote. This this is where maybe we're too hard on rugby league. Maybe it's a more general problem. Because Arthurson was talking about, um, you know, the money side of things. And he, he said, anyone going into it who thinks he's going to make a lump of money is having himself on. It's always been a struggle in Australia. The president of the Washington Redskins got it right when someone asked him one day if it was possible to make a small fortune out of sport. Easy, he replied. Just start out with a large fortune. <laughs> what a great line. <laughs> That's why I always respect guys like Rusty mm. that do it for the love of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Rusty's not making a ton of money out of South, you can bet your bottom mm. dollar. And I, I think that's probably what puts someone like Arthurson offside with, you know, blokes of the Broncos coming in and, you know, flashing their money around because he g- genuinely was into the rugby league side of things. And yeah, uh, no disrespect against Ken Arthur's an old school guy, legendary. But when you make when you finance your bloody sport with poker machines, mm. I've got no sympathy for, yeah. for the fact yeah. you can't make money. Yeah, yeah, very true. It's funny the section where he, where he's talking about John Rebo. So Rebo Reeves. Uh, John Rebo de Bressac, as he was his <laughs> name. Uh, so he was chief executive of the Broncos from the start, and that's how he became involved in Super League. And Do you think the French side really annoyed Arco as well? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> like, it's a Larish name. Yeah, it really is. But yeah, so obviously uh, Rebo had played under Arthurson at Manly in the early 80s, so they had like a working relationship and he he liked him in the book said Arthurson said he was an affable and popular club man and a darned good footballer I remember reading that as a teenager and thinking that's quite um yeah nice of Arco to yeah yeah uh, he said even at, at the at the heart of it they had a they ran in, into each other at, at an airport once like during the Super League war and just had an amicable amicable conversation they didn't talk about football, just, you know. Real old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love yeah, that. Yeah. And his parting words on Rebo were, I'm sure that Rebo and I will always have a civil relationship. There's some mutual respect there from years ago. And of course, it doesn't all evaporate. There are plenty of blokes on the Super League side that I wouldn't want to talk to. Rebo isn't one of them. Um, he didn't talk to Bullfrog Moore again, did he? They, yeah, they, so they did. So he, he talks about the... Um, the treachery of some of the club bosses. Peter Gow was one that he felt betrayed by, and um, I doubt they ever spoke again. Not as betrayed as uh, Barry Beef. Yeah. <laughs> so what what he says about bullfrogs actually quite moving. Um, I'll read it out. April Fool's Day, nineteen ninety five, is a day I'll never forget. With the stories and rumours raging around us, and separation of one from the other just about impossible. We held an emergency board meeting at the New South Wales Leagues Club. It was the day that Peter Moore, one of my closest friends for 30 years, resigned. I was in the league very early that morning. Peter rang home and told Barbara that he needed to see me. She told him I was already at Phillips Street. Our meeting in the boardroom on the first floor had just begun when there was a knock on the door. It was Peter. Could I see you privately for a few moments, he said to me. I excused myself and we headed across to one one of the offices. There Moore said to me, I'm sorry to tell you this, mate, but I'm going to have to resign. All my players have signed to go over to Super League. I've no option but to step down. I was rocked by the news. Have you given it plenty of thought, I asked him. He said he had. I'm sorry to see you go, I said. Obviously, you've given a lot of consideration and feel you have no choice. And that was it. Four or five minutes, a few words, and it was over. We shook hands and I went back to the meeting. There I broke the news of Moore's resignation. In the months following, it became a sore point for some people in the game that he and I kept in some sort of contact. But the friendship had been a close one for so long, an important one to both of us. It was no easy thing to throw away. The Peter, situ- Peter Moore situation was hard for me. 
We'd always been there for each other when things were tough. It was a very personal blow to me to realise he wouldn't be alongside to help fight the battle. That gives me chills. But the fact that highlights how close they are is he calls Barbara at yeah. home. Yeah, yeah. Like, seriously, mm. like how close mm. is this game back then? Yeah. And uh, earlier in the book, when he's talking about his role at Manly in the 70s, he said that him and Bullfrog had a standing agreement that they wouldn't poach each other's players. This is what I wanted to bring up with you. This is ongoing now with Gus and Nick Politis. How can you be a proper club boss when you rule out four clubs yeah, because yeah. you're mates with the yeah. guy? Like, mm-hmm. so, so you can sign Cooper Cronk, but I've got too much respect for uh, yeah, yeah. Bellamy, so I'm not going to approach his players. <laughs> like, what is that? As a fan, like, do you want that bloke leading a club to know that he's not going to have your best interests as a club at heart because he wants to preserve his friendship? Do you know what? That's actually in breach of the Corporations Act. If it's a public corporation, if you're not acting in the best corp- interest of the corporation, mm. you go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. So you can sign um, um, Boyd Cordner, but no, Uncle Nick's got him on. <laughs> so out of respect, I'm not going to sign him. But I mean, the relationships, like, I mean, to call his wife at home. Mm. The only thing I can think of is as close as, as me and Sean McRae's wife <laughs> when I called up as a teenager. But, um, yeah, it's, it just gives you chills. Mm. Um, so we'll turn to the Super League side of it. This is just an aside, but it, it was just it made me laugh too hard to not share it with you now. Um, we launched the 1995 season with a slap-up dinner at the Entertainment Centre in Sydney, hooking up with the four new clubs via giant TV screens. Mal Meninga, Australia's captain and not long back from his history-making fourth kangaroo tour, took to the stage to to launch League's brave new world of 1995. Mid-dinner, the curtains swished open to reveal the lush sounds of Yanni and his orchestra. (laughs) Rugby League had never been more ritzy. (laughs) I remember that. (laughs) Isn't that just so quaint? <laughs> We're getting Yanni. Oh, really? <laughs> like, I don't know if Yanni was ever, like, cool. But, like, 1995. <laughs> like, come on. Barely like getting, like, Andre Real now. <laughs> it's so funny. So, refresh me. I mean, I lived through this and I, still, I, I put it out of my mind almost. But 95 was the year... Super League was um, signed in early 95, but they yeah. played the season out. Yeah. 96. So, so 95, yeah, you, you had the players signed, then there was the court action. Then uh, it was late 95, I think, that the the ruling came down in favour of the ARL. Yeah. Um, then, then in 96, obviously, the comp continued as one with the, the appeal going. So um, honestly, if we had those expansion teams and got rid of some Sydney teams, it would have been the greatest thing ever. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you can take this with a grain of salt, but when Arthurson talks about the that expansion, he didn't view view it as a 20-team comp long term. He said, already at Phillips Street, we had decided to give the 20-team format two years to settle in and at that point to begin the hard steps towards rationalisation, the reducing of the number of Sydney clubs. So this is what I say to this day. They brought it upon themselves by not doing it earlier. Mm. If they'd done it earlier, the game would have been far stronger yeah. and they wouldn't have had to be in that position. Yeah. Um, no, it's tough, but... Yeah, yeah. And and Arson, you can tell, feels betrayed particularly by the three new clubs that signed with Super League months after their first game, yeah. not, like weeks after their first game, really. Um, which is, is pretty astounding when you think about it. But it's just that thing where you think, who's going to win? Yeah, and <laughs> if if you're the Warriors, if you're the Cowboys, if you're the Reds, and you've been given this vision of a global game, you know, one team, one city kind of thing, you're given that vision against an alternative of playing like 
playing north. You know, playing <laughs> north, playing west. You know, playing like there appears to be a tree in the uh, oval. <laughs> <laughs> we're at Leichhardt um, that gentleman appears to be watching the game from his bedroom <laughs> <laughs> see this is what I still maintain the vision is what we're all aspiring to eventually mm. yeah I don't want um, 8,000 people at a suburban ground no it's quaint but it's yeah. not sustainable yeah I, I don't know when I read that about how you know the ARL was planning to, to rationalise and you know give the four new clubs a chance to settle in and then make the decision on which Sydney clubs had to go. Part of me thinks that he's just saying that. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. The reason that they were put in that position where a media company could put them to the sword like that was because they dragged the chain for 20 years. Yeah. Mm. He got rid of Newtown. He saw yeah. the benefit of that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you can't be too critical of him. In that time, he did get rid of Newtown. He tried to get rid of West. He true, brought in true. the three new clubs. True, he true, brought true. in four more. All true. Uh, but yeah, maybe some missteps along the way. And I think he sees himself as the guy who was going to revolutionise the game. And then it was taken out of his hands. Yeah. Mm. Um, what I don't like through the whole Super League war, I was always in Newcastle a pariah. Because I, I, I supported the concept of Super League. I didn't want the war. But... Um, I was going to Mariners games just to annoy people. Um, <laughs> um, but the, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. to, to, to say Kerry Pack is some sort of like um, martyr in the whole thing, if they just worked out a deal between the pay TV companies before they sunk $200 million mm. each, yeah, yeah. the game would have been 10 yeah. times stronger. Mm. It's funny you mentioned Packer because, so obviously Packer like came out strong in favour of the ARL. And then once he saw there was money to be made from Super League, wanted a piece of that and ended up getting the rights for Monday Night Football. Arco would have been Dever. Oh, I'll, I'll read this. So so this is um, Arthurson speaking about when he first spoke to Packer about the Super League concept. So this was the World Sevens in 1995. It, it was, was going to revolutionise the game. <laughs> <laughs> in Packer's box at the SFS that day, I said to him, Kerry, I'm genuinely concerned about all this. I went on to raise the issue of docu the document presented by John Singleton to Canterbury CEO Peter Moore. I said to Packer, I wouldn't have thought that John Singleton would have put forward a proposal like that without your knowledge. Packer didn't answer that and I pressed on. What I'm getting around to, Kerry, is this. I wouldn't like to think that you would de do a deal with News Limited and leave us out in the cold. It was then that Packer uttered the words I would never forget, assuring me he would be doing no deal with News Limited. I put out my hand and looked him square in the eye. Thank you, Kerry. I appreciate that, I said. I would have bet my life on Packer honouring that pledge. For a start, why? <laughs> 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 like, Well, I mean, he's old school and a handshake meant handshake. That's why he would think that. <laughs> yeah, well, he's old school, yeah. but I mean, if he's running the ARL, he should realise that Kerry Packer <laughs> presented himself as an old school guy, but... Was you, you might remember something called World Series <laughs> Cricket. Um, and when the betrayal ultimately came, it was basically the straw that broke the camel's back. He said, Channel 9's move dragged me down about as far as it was possible for a fundamentally positive person like myself to go. I just started to feel that I couldn't take it anymore. And when I started to think like that, I was also figuring I'm not going to be much use to anybody if I'm on the, in this frame of mind. And um, yeah, so he... Step down later that year. It's like a great tragedy. Mm, mm. It's kind of sad to see you guys put that much into the game go out like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it really it's, is. It's outside his own control, really. Yeah. I mean, you could say you should have acted faster, but you're dealing with a rugby league. Nothing goes fast. And he, he really did leave the game a broken man, which is... My, my ultimate takeaway from that book is like, oh my God, like... Whatever you want to say about his failings, like this is this is tough to read. I'll, I'll read this. I left football disappointed and with not much more than faint hope for the future. It was not the way I would have chosen to go. In the previous year, two years, many things I had believed in had been challenged and in some cases destroyed forever. The game that had been my life had been tossed around like a cork on stormy waters. Its very long-term existence, threatened by those unholy partners in crime. Bronco greed and the ruthless corporate ambition of News Limited. 
I think it's kind of simplistic. I mean, the, the Ruthless was on the Optus side as well. Oh, y- yeah. Um, but you're right. It's tragic. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to minimise or downplay Arthurson's own failings and the ARL's own failings. Um, Not to mention the um, grand final um, entertainment with the, with the TV <laughs> falling down at uh, Optus Vision. That's that's just rugby league's luck, isn't it? <laughs> The ARL could do nothing about that, but it happened, you know? Like... <laughs> it's laughed about to this day. <laughs> Honestly, I remember reading this as a, as a young man, teenager, and um, it moved me then. But I mean, in my view, he's up there with Daily Messenger and guys like that that put their heart and soul into it. Mm. And without them, we wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. Seriously. Um, it might be just a suburban game with 5,000 people there without Arthurson. Yeah, yeah, definitely true. Very, very complicated figure in rugby league, but you can't deny his contribution. And my ultimate takeaway from this book is like, this guy loves rugby league. Yeah. Like Craig Foster, like level <laughs> love of his sport. <laughs> Check the book out that we've, we've really just skimmed the surface, especially with the Super League stuff. One thing I wanted to bring up was Quail. Yeah. I mean, that was a great dynamic duo. Mm. Two yeah. ex-players to be such great administrators. Yeah, yeah. And, and against the odds of 150,000 other crappy administrators. And he speaks so glowingly of Quail. Like, you could tell the love was there. It was, you know, a re- really good working partnership. And, and Quail was actually instrumental in, in one of the, the biggest innovations in rugby league history. Kicking to Bigger. <laughs> Tina Turner. Oh, my God. <laughs> She, he was basically her liaison through, throughout the whole thing. Like she was the he was the one she dealt with, and yeah. So he he is the genius who brought that to be. <laughs> so what did Colin Love bring into the game? <laughs> but yeah, so I don't want to touch too much on the Super League stuff because we could we could do ten episodes on on the Super League War, which I think we should, which we we should and will. Um, but yeah, so check the book out. It's called Arco My Game, uh, written by Arthurson and Ian Heads, of course. Who, Legendary figures in their own right. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to say, these books, the, the ones that came on the 90s, they're really hard to track down. I've had, I had a lot of trouble finding them. You can't just go to the bookstore. Go to your local library. I'm not just saying this as a plug to my trade. I'm saying it because that's where you're going to get these books. If they don't have it at your local library... Do an interlibrary loan. You can get it from somewhere else. You know where I sourced mine from in the 90s? Toronto Library. Really? Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Um, yeah. Heaps of great resources. Uh, yeah. But so anyway, uh, I, I highly recommend reading Arco My Game. Just one more thing. My Game. A yeah. Bit of ego yeah. in that. <laughs> Not our game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's this week's History Corner. That was great. Just, just-